Well, good morning. Let me begin by just saying the Lord Jesus Christ said that we need to enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Words of the Lord Jesus Christ, he talked about two paths to eternity, and that's what we want to talk about this morning. There is a Roman Catholic path to eternity, and there is a biblical path to eternity. If you look on the screen, you can see that the bottom line designates hell. You can see the flames coming up. The top line, the blue line, designates heaven. You can see all the Roman Catholics lined up to receive water baptism, because they are told through water baptism, their original sin is washed away. They become righteous before God. But as they commit what are called venial sins, which are lesser sins, they lose some of that righteousness. When they commit a mortal sin, such as adultery or murder or missing church on Sunday, they're now destined for hell again. They must be re-justified. The only way to do that is to confess to a priest, to start doing good works, receiving the sacraments, in hopes to merit the graces necessary for eternal life. Now you can see a treasury of merit above the blue line. The Catholic Church teaches that in this treasury contains the infinite merits of Jesus Christ, as well as the merits of Mary and all the saints that have died with more than enough merit to get them to heaven. Well, if a Roman Catholic who has gone through this cycle many, many times, each time a mortal sin is committed, he must be re-justified. And if he's been a good Catholic all of his life, and either rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ or never heard it, he will one day stand before Jesus at the great white throne. And only then will he recognize that his good works were not good enough, that God demands perfection. And he will hear the most terrifying words anyone could ever hear when Jesus says, depart from me, I never knew you. And he is cast into the eternal lake of fire. You see, this is the broad road that leads to destruction. It's the broad word, the broad way that is made up of works and self-righteousness. Now, Jesus also talked of a narrow way, and that's the biblical path to eternity. You can see that it's not baptism, but it's faith in Jesus Christ. And once we have been justified by God through faith, we then begin following Jesus through sanctification and God promises that those he justifies, he will one day glorify. So there's never an opportunity for those who have been justified to fall back down on the line destined for hell. That's the good news of the gospel. And so at the end of a believer's life, he will not meet Jesus at the great white throne, but at the Bema seat. And there he will hopefully hear the words, well done, my good and faithful servant. And will sing his praises for all eternity. Two roads to eternity. <laughs> now Jesus said in this passage that very few find the road to eternal life. Very few find the narrow road. Why is that, that very few find it? You see, that's the reason for the message this morning. We must tell those who are on the broad road about the narrow road. My uncle, who's been a Roman Catholic priest for over 56 years, he said, Mike, Mike, how can one billion Roman Catholics be wrong? And I took him to this passage. Wide is the road. Many are on it that leads to destruction. You see, Jesus said that we must... But we're saved by grace. Why do we need to strive? Well, it's because of the last part of that passage that there are false teachers dressed in sheep's clothing but inwardly are ferocious wolves. You see, these false teachers are standing in front of the narrow gate saying this isn't the way, it's the broad way. And so we need to tell people about the narrow road. We must tell Catholics the truth about the most trustworthy authority. We must tell them the truth about sin and Mary the truth about the Lord Jesus Christ. We must tell Catholics the truth about the gospel. 
and the truth about God's grace and the truth about God's righteousness. We'll spend a little bit of time on each one, but the most important, as we witness to Roman Catholics, is to nail down the first one. What is our most trustworthy authority? We all need to come to a knowledge of the truth to be saved, and so it's important that we go to the right authority. It's important that we go to a trustworthy authority. In James 1.8, we see that we are brought forth by God through the word of truth. In Ephesians 1.13, when you hear the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit who is a deposit guaranteeing our eternal inheritance. So we must have a knowledge of the truth in order to be saved. And true love loves truth, just as God loves truth and hates any false way. You see, there's so much tolerance within the body of Christ today. We tolerate other gospels and other Jesuses, but if we really love God and love the truth, we will also hate every false way. Some religious people have a form of godliness, but never come to a knowledge of the truth. We need to be aware of that. And when truth is compromised with error, it is no longer true. You see, that's why Paul said, if anyone comes preaching another gospel, let them be accursed. Let them be turned over to God for condemnation, because the very gospel that saves us must remain pure. And if you have a high-protein drink that you drink to become strong and healthy, if you were to add one drop of poison to that drink, would it still be healthy for you? No, it would be deadly. And so it is with truth. Truth cannot be compromised. And truth protects us from deception. It sets captives free. One of the characteristics of a disciple of Christ is that they will abide in the word of Christ, they will know the truth, and the truth will set them free. Free from what? The bondage of deception. It's truth that protects us from false doctrines, from crafty schemes and the trickery of men. I don't know if many of you have traveled since 911, but when you go to the airport now, you've got to get there several hours early because everything needs to be examined. Your luggage, then you go through the metal detector for airport security, You know, as I was standing in this line to go through the metal detector, I thought, wouldn't it be nice if there was a deception detector? (laughs) You know, that you could walk through a detector and all of your false beliefs would be exposed. I thought to myself, I wonder how many people would want to go through that. Because you see, we all like to cling to some of those things that we brought into our salvation experience, don't we? Some of the traditions... But imagine for a moment if you had a chance to walk through a deception detector. Then the alarm goes off and it said, you're still trusting in your works. You're still trusting in your self-righteousness. You must repent, change your mind, and know the truth. Those who have been deceived need to be corrected in hopes that God would grant repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth. Who is it that's going to do the correcting? Those that know the truth, we must tell others the truth in hopes that God would lead them to repentance. The most trustworthy authority is clearly the Lord Jesus Christ in his word. In John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the truth. No one comes to the Father except through me. In John 17, 17, he said, thy word is truth. And we even know that Jesus came to this earth to testify to the truth. So if anyone's searching for the truth, we need to look no further than Christ and his word. The Bible is the only objective, divinely inspired authority for discerning God's truth from the errors of men. You see, the Roman Catholic Catechism is not inspired. It's written by fallible men. And so anyone that looks to there for the truth can easily be deceived. We must go to the most trustworthy authority. Those who follow other authorities are prone to deception. Well, when we look at the Roman Catholic Church, we see that they have multiple authorities. Sacred tradition, sacred scripture, 
and the magisterium of the church are so connected that one of them cannot stand without the other. They all contribute effectively to the salvation of souls. I thought it was the word of God and the spirit of God that brought forth, brought forth conversions. But here we see there's two other things that the Roman Catholic Church is incorporating. The magisterium is a collection of all the bishops within the Roman Catholic Church. And when they speak in one voice, they are said to be infallible, that they can never err when it comes to faith and morals. So the three authorities of the Roman Catholic Church would be their tradition, the magisterium of the church, as well as scripture. Now in theory, they tell you that all three of these authorities are equal, but let's take a closer look. In the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 82, the church says that we do not derive our authority, our, our certainty about all revealed truth from the Holy Scriptures alone. Both scripture and tradition must be accepted and honored with equal sentiments of devotion and reverence. So there you clearly see that tradition and the word of God are said to be equal. Now the Catholic Church goes one step further. It says that their tradition is the word of God. I'm going to share with you a timeline of the traditions of the Catholic Church. Keep in mind that they believe that this is the word of God. In 431, the Catholic Church pronounced that water baptism is what regenerates the soul. Water baptism washes away the sin. You become a child of God. You're indwelt with the Holy Spirit. You're now destined for heaven. Simply because the Catholics believe the water is efficacious when the priest pours it over the infant or the adult. Then in 500, the Mass was instituted. The Mass is a representation of Jesus Christ on the altars of Roman Catholic churches. He goes there as a victim for the propitiation of God's wrath for all the Catholics that are gathered there during the Mass. And then we have indulgences. One of the things that sparked the Reformation. An indulgence is the selling of God's grace. It's the remission of temporal punishment due for sin. I brought a couple of examples of an indulgence. Maybe the most popular example is the rosary. It is the rosary that Catholics are said if they pray these 53 prayers to Mary that they will receive time off in purgatory. The punishment for their venial sins will be remitted. I also have a brown scapula and Catholics are told that if they wear this scapula, and if they're wearing this scapula at the time of their death, Mary promises to remove them from the fires of purgatory on the first Saturday after their death. If you kiss this object of piety, you receive temporal punishment off for your sins. These are indulgences. Transubstantiation, a big word that simply means that the Roman Catholic priest has the power to call Jesus Christ down from heaven and then transubstantiate or change the inner substance of this wafer into the physical body and blood, soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. The priest lifts this up for all the Catholics to worship this as their God and creator and savior. And then Jesus is laid on the altar to be represented as a victim for all the Catholics that are gathered there at the Mass. That's transubstantiation. Purgatory is a place where Catholics go after this life to be purged of the sin that Jesus Christ was unable to purge by his shed blood. You see, Catholics believe that they're neither good enough for heaven nor bad enough for hell. So this intermediate place prepares them for the holiness of heaven. Well, after the Reformation, the Catholic Church came out with a counter-reformation in the 16th century. This is when they elevated their tradition, these traditions that you're seeing, to be equal in authority with God's holy word. Two of the last three infallible pronouncements have to do with Mary. In 1854, the Pope pronounced that Mary was immaculately conceived, that is, that she was conceived without sin and then went on to live a sinless life. Vatican Council I, there was a declaration that all the popes have been infallible. 
that any time a pope teaches about faith and morals, he cannot err. And so in 1950, Catholics began asking the question, you say that Mary never sinned, but yet sin is what causes death and the body to decay. Where's Mary's body? And so the Pope pronounced in 1950 that Mary's body was miraculously assumed into heaven. These are Catholic traditions that are said to be the word of God. Well, Catholics have arguments for why their tradition is authoritative. I want to share those with you because this is what they will say. It was Paul who told us to stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. Sounds like a good argument, doesn't it? That we're to hold to these traditions. But if you look closely, you will see that these traditions were taught, past tense. They've already been delivered. And look at the source of these traditions, the apostles. So apostolic traditions are what we are to hold onto. In fact, it was Jude who said that we're to earnestly contend for the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints. When the last apostle died, that body of truth is what we're to contend for. Those traditions and the word of God is what we're to contend for. And they'll also point to 1 Corinthians 11:2 where Paul said, hold firmly to the traditions just as I delivered them to you. Once again, you see it's past tense. Paul's already delivered them, and the source is an apostle. Well, does the Bible give us warnings about trusting traditions? Yes. There's only three times where tradition is spoken of in a positive sense. I just shared those with you, two of them. But there are many warnings. Jesus himself said to the religious leaders of his day that you invalidated the word of God for the sake of your tradition. Matthew 15, 6. Jesus also said that neglecting the commandment of God, you are holding to the tradition of men. And you nicely set aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. Can you see how it's used in a negative sense that we are warned not to hold on to traditions when they invalidate God's word? Well, there's a tradition that's practiced in the Philippines every Good Friday. Philippine men, upwards of 16 of them, are nailed to a cross to expiate their sins. Paul spoke of this, didn't he, in Colossians 2.8. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. Can you see once again the choices that we make? Are we going to follow the traditions of men of the world, or are we going to follow Christ? Well, these Philippine men don't die on the cross. They're simply nailed there for a few hours, and it is said that this helps them expiate their sin. Well, as we witness to Roman Catholics and we share the truth of God's word with them, one of the things that I like to do is take them to the book of Acts. You know that it's the history book of the first century church. So I ask Catholics, you say that your church was founded by Peter and that your church never changes. Why then don't we find priests offering sacrifices for sins in the first century church? Why don't we find indulgences remitting punishment for sin? Why don't we, sign, we find Christians praying for souls in purgatory? Why don't we find church leaders forbidden to marry? On the contrary, in 1 Corinthians 9, 6, Paul says, don't we have a right to take along a believing wife? We know that Peter was married. He had a mother-in-law. Why don't we find infallible men in the first century church? The only thing infallible we find is the word of God. And why don't we find salvation dispensed through the sacraments? That's what the Catholic Church teaches. You don't get salvation all at once. You get it on the installment method. You have to keep coming back week after week. And as you receive the sacraments, you get more sacramental grace, which is ultimately what saves you. Have you ever wondered why 
the Catholic Church is calling us all back home to Rome? You see, they say that we don't have the fullness of salvation because we don't have the sacraments. But yet I know my sins are completely forgiven, that I have a permanent right standing before God because of my faith in the only righteous one. I have the assurance of eternal life and a direct, intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. How much fuller could my salvation be? But you see, none of those four things I just listed do Roman Catholics have but yet they claim to have the fullness of salvation. And why is it that we don't find these rosaries, these scapulars, the holy water and crucifixes and statues in the first century church? You see, if you begin asking Catholics these questions, they will begin to wonder if, in fact, they've been taught the truth. So we ask the question, what happens when tradition does not conform with Scripture? Well, the magisterium rules. You see, I said in theory they are all equal, but whenever these two appear to contradict one another, as we've just looked at, it is the magisterium that sits above these two other authorities, and they interpret the Scriptures such that they will always conform with the traditions of the Catholic Church. And sometimes it takes a lot of twisting and a lot of distorting to make it conform. Well, we've just looked at tradition, one of the authorities of the Catholic Church. Now let's look at the magisterium. Is it right to trust men? Is it right to trust bishops and priests and popes? Psalm 118.8 tells us it is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in men. Do you realize that if you start in Genesis 1-1 and go through the end of Revelation, line up all the scriptures and point to the middle verse, this is what you'll find, Psalm 118.8. This is the theme of the Bible, to trust in God, not in men. So there's another warning we find in Psalm 146.3. Do not trust in princes and mortal men in whom there is no salvation. Paul went preaching to the Berean church, Acts 17, 11. I know many of you are familiar with this, but it's good to share with Catholics because here you had the apostle Paul who wrote over half the New Testament. When he began preaching, what did the Bereans do? They started searching the scriptures to verify the truthfulness of Paul's message. And I tell Catholics, if the apostle Paul who wrote over half the New Testament, was under the scrutiny of God's word, shouldn't you put your pope and your bishops and your priests under the same scrutiny? Shouldn't I come under the same scrutiny? The word of God needs to be our plumb line for truth. Well, there are other warnings about trusting men. When I went to Israel the first time, I guess it's been about 10 years ago, I went with Charlie Dyer, Dallas Theological Seminary. We're out in the middle of the Negev Desert. And I saw Charlie on his stomach taking a picture of this old withered bush in the middle of nowhere. I said, Charlie, what's the significance of that bush? He said, well, if you'll turn to Jeremiah chapter 17, you'll see. It's a picture of a man who puts his trust in man. The Lord says, cursed is the man who trusts in mankind and whose heart turns away from the Lord for he will be like a bush in the desert and will live in stony waste in the wilderness, a land of salt without inhabitant. This is a picture of one who puts his trust in man. The Lord goes on to say through the prophet Jeremiah that those who trust in the Lord will be like a tree planted by living water. Well, there's another warning about trusting in men. You know, oftentimes Roman Catholics say, why don't you just go read the early church fathers? They'll set you straight about the truth. And I tell them, how do you know that the early church fathers aren't the very people that Paul was speaking of in this passage? Paul says, after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things. For what reason? To draw away disciples after them. Therefore, be on the alert. 
Why should we go read the early church fathers when we can read the inspired word of God? The very men who were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Well, Jesus condemned the religious leaders of his day, the Jewish religious leaders, the scribes and Pharisees. He went so far as to call them children of Satan in John 8, 44. Why would Jesus do that to the leaders of his own people? Because they were making their converts sons of hell, Matthew 23, 15. They were shutting the kingdom of God to those who wanted to enter, Matthew 23, 13. They were nullifying and opposing God's word with their tradition. And they were being blind guides and hypocrites. Again, I share with Catholics, if God's chosen people's leadership could become corrupt to the point that Jesus called them children of Satan, isn't it possible that the Roman Catholic Church could also become corrupt in its hierarchy of teachers? You see, if the Roman Catholic Church is teaching another gospel, they're shutting the kingdom of God in men's faces. They're not allowing those who want to enter to enter. Again, that is why we must share the truth with Roman Catholics. Well, there are no infallible men, and we can even point to the scriptures. Catholics would say that Peter was their first pope. We have proof that Peter was not infallible in Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 to 14. Paul opposed Peter to his face. Why? Because he stood condemned. The rest of the Jews, even Barnabas, joined him in hypocrisy. Paul publicly rebuked Peter for not being straightforward about the truth of the gospel. Now, you remember what infallible means. You cannot err when it comes to faith, and morals. Does the gospel have anything to do with faith? Peter was not being straightforward about the truth of the gospel, and so Paul publicly rebuked him. Now, why would Paul do that publicly? Why wouldn't he just take Peter aside? Because, you see, when the gospel was being perverted, a public correction needed to be done so that those who had been misled could know the truth. It's not popular to expose false doctrines, but we need to do it publicly. When you look at uh, the Second Timothy, you see in each chapter, Paul exposed two false teachers. You would think in today's climate that would be a very unloving thing to do. Why would Paul do that? So others would not be deceived by listening to them teach. We need to do the same today when a person is leading people to hell with a false gospel, we need to publicly correct them. We have an example of why popes could never be infallible. In 1431, one pope condemned Joan of Arc as a heretic and burned her at the stake. Another pope re re revoked her condemnation 24 years later. And still another pope exalted her to sainthood in 1920. Again, this has everything to do with faith, but you can see the popes could not agree on this. Who would reject God's word as a foundation for truth? It's important to have a strong foundation, isn't it? Otherwise, you might be like the leaning tower of Pisa. Jesus said, everyone who hears his words and does not act upon them will be like a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. Eternal destiny is something that we need to be sure about. We need to make sure we're building our foundation on solid rock. And who is the solid rock? The Lord Jesus Christ in his word. Well, when we look at trusting men and trusting tradition, we know that there's a more trustworthy authority. It's the Bible itself. The Bible testifies that it is true, authoritative, inerrant, and infallible. It is pure, powerful, perfect, and purposeful. It is holy, living, eternal, and sufficient. Forever settled in heaven and can be used both as an offensive weapon and as a defensive weapon. It brings conviction. It converts and produces faith. 
It gives wisdom and hope. It judges. It rebukes deceivers and exposes error. Can anything be said about tradition in men when it comes regard, regarding the truth of God's word? Is there anything that compares to God's word when it is described this way? So what can we say? What is the most trustworthy authority? It's surely not tradition, and it's not the magisterium of the Catholic Church. God's word reigns supreme. Amen? Amen. Now that we've nailed down the most trustworthy authority, now we need to look at these six other essentials of the gospel. Catholics need to know the truth about sin, that all sin is mortal. There is no such thing as venial sin. James 2.10 says, if you keep the entire law and yet stumble at just one part, you're guilty of breaking the entire law. Ezekiel 18.4 says, the soul that sins will surely die. All sin is deadly. The wages of sin is death. And the punishment for sin is eternal death. Not temporal punishment. It's the eternal separation from God in hell, the eternal lake of fire. And the only remedy for sin is the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. It is only the shed blood of Christ that can purify us of our sin. And the good gospel is that after God forgives sin, he remembers them no more and never counts them against us again. I love 2 Corinthians 5.19, where we see that God is reconciling the world to himself through Jesus Christ, not counting men's sins against them. Once you are an adopted son of God into his holy family, once he has justified you, that is a permanent standing before a holy God. God sees you now as righteous, not because you are, but because you have the Lord Jesus Christ in you. That's what he sees. Well, the Vatican teaches that venial sins are not serious enough to warrant eternal punishment, only temporal punishment, paragraph 1854. It also teaches that these venial sins can be remitted without the blood of Christ by indulgences. And these venial sins can be purged by the fires of purgatory. Fire has no effect on sin. That's why hell is eternal. Only the shed blood of Jesus can purify our sin. Pope John Paul II said that hell is not a punishment imposed by God, but the condition resulting from attitudes and actions which people adopt in this life. Detroit News, July of 99. Don't you know that Bill and Hillary were pleased to hear this? <laughs> well, John Paul II also said Christ's blood is unnecessary. At the turn of the millennium, he introduced a millennium indulgence. He said that sin's punishments can be remitted by abstaining from unnecessary consumption of tobacco or alcohol or donating a proportionate sum of money to the poor. You know, I tell Catholics, if I were still a Catholic, I would begin smoking just so I could quit and get a plenary indulgence. <laughs> this is so sad, isn't it? Where's the blood of Christ? And yet we have even evangelical leaders that address this man as Holy Father, a title given only to God and the scriptures. Catholics need to know the truth about Mary. She is not sinless, even though their catechism says she was without a single sin to restrain her, paragraph 969. Mary is not co-redeemer, even though their catechism says she became the cause of salvation for herself and the whole human race, paragraph 969 also. And she is not mediatrix, even though the catechism says by her manifold intercession, she continues to bring us the gifts of eternal Paragraph 494. And she is not to be worshipped, even though their catechism says devotion to the Blessed Virgin is intrinsic to Christian worship. Paragraph 971. 
John Paul II has dedicated his entire papacy to Mary. On his garments, he wears in Latin the inscription, Mary, I am all yours. Here you see John Paul kneeling before a statue of Mary and trusting the responsibility of the whole church to the maternal intercession of Mary. As I saw this picture, there was a verse that came to mind, Romans 125, where Paul said, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. Isn't that what Catholics do when they pray to Mary, they worship and venerate Mary, bow down before her statue? Catholics need to know the truth about Jesus Christ. They need to know that he is necessary and sufficient to save sinners completely and forever. Boy, if you could write that down and share that, that one statement with Catholics. Jesus is necessary and sufficient to save sinners completely and forever. He finished the work of man's redemption. In John 19.30, before he gave up his spirit, it is finished, he said, to telestai, paid in full. The eternal debt for sin has been paid. His sacrifice was perfect and complete. There are now no more offerings for sin, clearly stated in Hebrews 10.18. But yet every day, 200,000 times a day, Roman Catholic priests offer to God a representation of Jesus Christ when the Bible clearly says there are no more offerings. Jesus will not return to the earth until after the tribulation. Matthew 24, 29 to 31, you'll see why that's important to share with Catholics in just a moment. But John Paul II said that Jesus is not necessary. In December of 2000, he said that all who seek God with a sincere heart including those who do not know Christ, will enter God's kingdom. Universal salvation. Christ is unnecessary. All roads lead to heaven. So says the man they call Holy Father. The Catholics present another Jesus. In this Eucharist, the body and blood, together with the soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ, and therefore the whole Christ, is truly, really, and substantially contained. Paragraph 1374. They don't want you to miss the fact that this is the physical body and blood of Jesus Christ. You see the monstrance here. The Eucharist is actually placed in the center of that. It's a sunburst coming from one of the pagan traditions of the sun god. Well, Jesus was never a victim. He went willingly to the cross and laid his life down. But yet, Father John O'Brien, in his book, The Faith of Millions, says that the priest reaches up into the heavens, brings Christ down from his throne, and places him upon our altar to be offered up again as the victim for the sins of men. What power these priests are said to have to call Almighty God down from heaven. This Envoy magazine is a popular Catholic periodical. On the cover you see the words, this looks like bread, tastes like bread, and feels like bread. Is this God? And you open the magazine, and the article tries to persuade you that through the miracle of transubstantiation, this lifeless, inanimate piece of bread has become Almighty God. The Catholic Church has another offering, in paragraph 1367, we read the sacrifice of Christ and the sacrifice of the Eucharist are one single sacrifice. The victim is one and the same. In this divine sacrifice, the same Christ who offered himself once in a bloody manner on the altar of the cross is contained and is offered in an unbloody manner. What have they done here? Not only are they making another offering, can you see that they're making an unbloody offering? How can it be the same sacrifice when the true sacrifice, Jesus shed real blood, and now the same sacrifice is a bloodless sacrifice? They've taken away the one element that is efficacious in purifying sin.
What did Jesus say in Matthew 24, 23? If anyone says to you, Behold, here is the Christ, do not believe him. And yet that's exactly what John Paul does when he lifts this up. He says, Body of Christ. And Catholics say, Amen. Jesus said, Don't believe them. Catholics need to know the truth about the gospel. It is what God has done to save sinners, not what sinners must do for God. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 to 4. It is good news because it offers complete forgiveness from all the guilt and all the punishment of all sin. Colossians 2, 13 to 14. It is good news because Jesus will never lose or cast out anyone who comes to him with empty hands of faith. What's the only thing we can bring to Jesus? It's our sin. What the Roman Catholic gospel offers only partial forgiveness from the guilt and punishment of sin. Catholics know that they always have re residual sin that must be paid for themselves in purgatory. You saw the chart each time they commit a mortal sin, they're now destined for hell. The Catholic gospel offers a way for Catholics to save themselves from purgatory through indulgences. And it brings condemnation for those who teach it. Remember the Judaizers only added one thing to the gospel of grace. You must be circumcised. The Catholic Church has added many more requirements to the gospel. And so just as the Judaizers were condemned, accursed, anathema, so those who teach the Roman Catholic gospel are also under God's condemnation. We need to rescue Roman Catholics, teach them the truth about the gospel of Jesus Christ. They need to know the truth about grace. It is the unmerited favor of God. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, so that no man can boast. It's the only means by which God saves sinners. So anyone who attempts to merit God's grace has nullified the only means by which God will save them, Romans 11:6. Anyone who attempts to become righteous by obeying the law has also nullified God's grace, Galatians 2:21. Well, the Catholic Church has a perversion of grace. In paragraph 2027, Catholics are taught that they can merit for themselves and for others all the graces needed to attain eternal life. How can you merit the unmerited favor of God? Catholics must receive sacraments which are necessary for salvation. And the sacraments are said to be efficacious signs of grace by which divine life is dispensed to us. Grace is unmerited. We don't need to do sacraments. God gives grace freely to those who come to Christ in faith. And finally, Catholics need to know the truth about God's righteousness. They need to know that God's righteousness demands perfect righteousness for entrance into heaven. Revelation 21, 27 tells us that nothing impure will enter into heaven. God's righteousness is credited by faith instantly by a singular act of God, not infused by works through continuous rejustifications, Romans 4, 5. And God's righteousness is an irrevocable gift of grace which can never be lost, Romans 5, 17 and Romans eleven twenty nine. 29. Men's righteousness always falls short. Not knowing about God's righteousness, Catholics seek to establish their own by doing good works, receiving sacraments, and achieving holiness in purgatory. No one is righteous or can become righteous by obeying the law or by doing good works. We see that clearly in Romans 3, 10 to 28. And all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all of our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. Isaiah 64, 6. Favorite verses in all of Scripture we find in 2 Corinthians 5, 21. I call it the greatest exchange in human history. We see there that Jesus Christ became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So by faith, 
Christ becomes our sin bearer. He bears our sin and takes upon the wrath of God. And what does he give us in return? His perfect righteousness. What an exchange. Come to the cross with empty hands of faith. We must tell Catholics to obey Christ's first command, that is to repent. Forsake all efforts to save themselves. That means forsake all of your works, your sacraments, purgatory, indulgences, self-righteousness, the sacrifice of the mass, and believe the gospel. Repent and believe the gospel, the first command of Jesus in Mark 1.15. Trust the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the complete forgiveness of their sins in a right standing before God. Let me close with important contrast to consider. The Bible is what God says. Religion is what man says God says. We cannot trust religion. We cannot trust men. We can go directly to the source. The Bible offers a relationship with God through his son, a living savior. Religion only offers a futile attempt for a man to become right with God. As I close, I would like to share with you what happened about a year ago. I was invited to a Baptist church in Northern California. The pastor encouraged everyone to invite their Catholic friends because I would be speaking on the distinctions between Roman Catholicism and biblical Christianity. Well, after the message, there was a Catholic couple that came up, said, Mike, you've provoked our thinking. We'd like to take you to lunch and ask you some more questions. So we went to a pizza parlor and he and his wife brought their Catholic Bible. And for three hours, Sergio and Lindsay asked me question after question. Sergio was primarily asking the questions, but each time he asked a question, I would turn in his Bible and let God answer the question for him. Three hours this went on, question after question, answered by God's holy word. So at the end of the three hours, Sergio and Lindsay were about to leave. I said, Sergio, you remember the word picture I gave you this morning? Remember the set of monkey bars suspended over hell? And Catholics are clinging to all the rungs that they said would save them from hell. You must be baptized. You must receive the sacraments. Do good works. Obey the law. Do indulgences. Believe in purgatory. You remember I said Jesus is suspended between you and hell, saying, let go of those things that cannot save you. And I promise when you do, I will. And you remember I said, if you're still clinging to those things that can't save you when you die, that Jesus won't be there? He said, yeah, I remember. I said, are you ready now to let go and let Jesus save you? Sergio began weeping. Tears came to his eyes. I know now that he was processing, what am I going to tell my family? What am I going to tell my priest? What am I going to tell my friends? I know this is true. So I just let him weep for a couple of minutes. Finally, I put my arm on his shoulder and I said, Sergio, this will be the wisest and the safest decision you'll ever make in your life. It's the wisest decision because every one of your questions has been answered by God's word. And it's the safest decision because who better to trust than the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation? So I asked the question again, are you ready to let go and trust Jesus to save you? And before he could say anything, his wife, Lindsay, blurted out, I am. <laughs> so Sergio looked up at me with tears still in his eyes, and he said, well, what do I need to do? I just love to hear those words. So I turned to Romans 10, 9, and 10, and I let God answer that question. Paul says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Sergio, look at verse 13. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That's all you got to do. Sergio bowed his head and said, Jesus, save me. Then he got up and gave me a big, hair, big old bear hug. Well, praise God, Sergio is here today, a year later.
Not only that, but Sergio told me before I came up that his brother Mario is also here and he trusted Christ last week out of the Catholic Church. He also told me that several months ago his sister trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, so <laughs> praise God. Our gracious and holy Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for his word that gives us the confidence in discerning truth from error. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be an ambassador for the Lord Jesus Christ, to take his message to a lost and dying world. And Father, if there be anyone here that's still clinging to those things that cannot save them, by your grace, I pray that they would turn to Jesus Christ and trust him alone as their only hope of salvation. And we thank you in the precious name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen.